everyone who is joining us. Thank you for coming in. Man, do I have some great information to share with you tonight from the living, powerful Word of God. Thanks for joining. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing my notes and my study for this uh, Bible study lesson, we are definitely living in some scary times, right? I mean, you don't have to stand up there and be, you know, all, you know, holy and I'm not afraid. I'm not saying we should be fearful, but I'm saying we should definitely make sure we're looking around and see that these are the times that more than ever, you're going to need to make sure that you are living your, your life by this very one, very powerful one syllable word that upholds all of our uh, walking Christ, and that is called faith. I know sometimes you hear a lot of stuff on faith and you think, I've been inundated about faith. What is he talking about? Well, this study has been different. If you're just joining us, go back and listen to the other entrances that we put into this study. And what we talked about in the earlier study, what prompted this whole revelation for me is when I hear people, someone said to me, Pastor, I need more faith. Well, you don't. You don't need more faith. You need to put the faith you have into action. I share with you how the Bible said we're given the measure of faith. Go back and look at it. But what I'm telling you now is you don't need more faith. You need to put your faith into action. Watch this. As you put your faith into action, your faith grows, your faith develops, your faith gets better, your faith gets stronger. So it's the action that makes our faith better. You better write that down. Let me stop and say this to everyone. If you're just joining us, please like and share this broadcast. Call someone and let them know. Because tonight I'm going to be talking about how you can handle the adversities of our present condition in this world. The Israel-Hamas war is going into a humanitarian disaster. And yet there are some biblical implications that I can't talk about on this lesson that makes us have to also take note to Israel and what's happening in Israel, what's happening in the Gaza Strip. And all of these things are signs that have been fulfilled in Scripture, that are being fulfilled in Scripture, that are making Scripture come alive. And all of these signs let us know that we are living in a day more and more where you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice how you're going to live. That's why this lesson is called, Put Your Faith Into Action, You're Going To Need It. The revelation is God is ready. So when we look at where we have been, we need to understand about faith. Now i got to pray because the Spirit of God is telling me somebody needs this prayer because you need to be turned on by the fact that there's something that calls faith, that is called faith in God that even exists. Follow me. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you by your own sovereign will and by your own wisdom. You decided to share it with us, to share in our walk, to leave us your word, to guide us, to take us to a place that we never have to worry about where we are or what's going on or what's happening around us because we are rooted and grounded in your word. Somebody listening to me is safe. They need to say, I'm safe tonight. Safe because of the fact that I am living, walking, putting my faith into action, leaving a, living a life of action by faith in God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's go to what you call a very familiar pastor scripture. But let's look at it again. You know, people always say to me, Pastor, I know that pastor, that pastor, <laughs> pastor, that passage of scripture. I say, do you really? You know, when I'm sitting down there preaching, sometimes the Holy Spirit plays with me because I'm reading a, a text that I know I've preached before. I'm getting ready to preach it again. And I think about the fact of all I studied and learned when I preached it before. And the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing in brand new thoughts of bringing me to another place because God wants to use that text to deliver you now. Can I start by letting someone know what you're in for by telling you this? There is nothing you can't be delivered from by faith. 
There is nothing that the enemy can do to you that your faith can't get you delivered from. There is nothing that you can't wish for, hope for, desire, that if you live your life right and you trust God, it will come to pass. Faith is our passport. It is uh, our passport into that realm of the Holy Spirit. It is the key that we unlock all of the mystery and power of God just by faith. Just by trust and believe. Isn't that powerful? God said, I'm not going to leave you a lot to do, but if you can just trust me by faith, you will have done enough. So right now, I just need to get your, your thinking, your spiritual thinking cap on and understand something that people who live by faith go, they go through ups, they go through downs, they go through good days and bad days, but at the end of the day, they walk in victory. That ought to be some good news to somebody. Somebody ought to just talk back to me right now and say, but I know by faith I'm going to walk in victory. I know it's hard. I know the stuff you're going through is bad, but you need to be able to say, but I already have the victory. I'm going to hold on to my faith. Oh, I felt that from someone. I'm going to hold on to my faith. And that faith in God is so powerful. How do I know? Again, let's look at Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11 with me. You don't need your Bible here. We're going to look at several scriptures today that will instill that faith in you, right? Um, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So that a lot of times you like to listen to pastors and preachers. I got nothing wrong with that. They set up scriptures and they are, I mean, they set up their texts and their the message they want to give you, and they're great orators, and they bring in all kinds of examples. I do the same, but make sure that what holds everything together is the Word of God. Because you know what? Nothing else will change you but the Word of God. Come on, you want to be changed? Follow me on this scripture. Don't say you know. Just follow me and listen to what God is saying. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, Now faith is the substance. This is the definition of faith. Here's the definition. You don't have to look for it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Just like our natural eye, my eye is a sense that can say, this is my cell phone. I see that. Um, this lets me know by faith that this substance lets me know that this cell phone exists. I can see it. Well, faith is the substance that lets me know God exists. It, it, I, I can hold it. Uh, I, I can feel it. What I mean by that is when I get faith in my heart, it is my substance. I don't even think about it because faith lets me know that it is real. Sometimes when we think stuff is real that we can see and feel. But your faith is real because it is a substance that you use to get blessed. Watch this. It is the evidence of things not seen. Again, my eyes tell me this, faith, uh, this phone exists. My faith tells me God exists. So if God exists and I know something about God, then I believe what I see by my faith and not what I see by just my natural eye. Are you with me? It's just not my circumstances. The world is trapped into that sensory perception of only being able to live by what they see here, right? But we know our faith overrides what we just see and hear because we do it by trust. So if we look at what Hebrews is telling us, it says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. By what? By faith, they had a good testimony, is what the word there is. Here's what it's saying. When I read the Bible, there's a testimony in the word of God that lets me know that what the elders, who are the elders? All the believers who went through before us, who had a testimony. And I know Abraham has to be one of those. When you think about Father Abraham, you think about the fact that his testimony of walking out and going where God, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, told him to go. But he didn't even know where he was going. But he went there by faith because he trusted God. I love this because when we look at Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have Oh, that's powerful. God said, I'm going to write this down. Here is an eyewitness report of how powerful I am. And think back. If you were to sit there and write down some of your testimonies of some of the things you've been through, then you would have a written account of how God took you through that situation. Well, that's what the Bible does for us. 
And when you see the book that talk about the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, no, God said all of his word that he lets the New Test Old Testament saints went through was written for our learning. This is what Paul was telling the church of Rome. He was telling them this was written so you would have enough understanding to have faith in God. And it says, through faith, we understand. I love this. This is what happens with faith. We understand. Don't miss that. Through faith. I can't understand it any other way. This is powerful, man, because I can't sit there in my understanding naturally or in my understanding based on my situation or in my understanding based even on my experiences, some of them, and I can't sit there and say, this can happen. But through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. But um, I... I know the world was framed by the word of God by faith. Again, faith tells me that because it's my substance, it's my things hoped for, but I know it because I trust God. And it says, so the things which were seen were not made of the things which do appear. Here's what we need to understand. So the things which are seen were not made by the things that appear. Watch me. Here's what you need to understand. We understand that the worlds were made by the word of God, right? How do I understand that? By faith. So everything I see was not made by the things I see. Meaning that scientists and the world believes that the world was made from some other, you know, things that were amoebas or you talk about the Big Bang, you talk about whatever you talk about in your theory of evolution, they had to be a, a, a substance, something that created the world. We don't believe that. Because we understand by faith that it was God that did it because the world had to be made by an intelligent person who does incredibly integral designs of things. When you look at the smallest of creatures, um, isn't this something that we're talking about by faith and weaknesses and strength that there's a story that talks about um, a butterfly uh, this man watched a butterfly trying, a monarch butterfly coming out of its cocoon. You heard this. And as the man saw the butterfly struggling, you know, it was a caterpillar and it was turning into a butterfly and it was trying to get out of the cocoon. And the man watched it struggle and struggle. Then all of a sudden he decided to get the scissors and snip, snip. And, he, and all of a sudden the, the butterfly fell out of the cocoon. But arms were, you know, the wings were like stuck to the body and the body was just sitting there lifeless and the man thought you know he touched it pretty soon the uh, wings are going to open up and it's going to turn into a big butterfly but it did not the metamorphosis the incredible metamorphosis that god created in that butterfly had to go through the in that caterpillar had to go through the process to become a butterfly so when we try to short circuit the process don't go through the pain don't go through the struggle of believing in what we're believing for we're like that butterfly our faith just rolls out and drops dead and you're wondering why things didn't happen because real people who live by faith go through the ups and downs. There's darkness in living by faith. It wouldn't be faith if I could see my way out. It wouldn't be faith if everything was okay. Why are you complaining about this didn't happen? It wouldn't be faith. You don't need faith for stuff that drops in your lap. You need faith so you can see beyond what you're looking at and trust that God has the ability. You need the kind of faith that takes you into that realm of, of being just mesmerized and, and being surprised and in awe when Jesus Christ stepped out on the bow of that ship in the middle of the storm and through the power of his words, he just says, peace be still. And things became still because God is powerful enough to talk to and control nature. If my God... Through reading the word of God, I learned this is that strong. What am I worried about? If you're going through a struggle to live by faith, it's a normal process, but at the end you will blossom. But please don't try to short circuit what you're going through. Because I'm getting ready to show you something. 
that the reason a lot of the faith that we're trying to live by doesn't work because we got that easy kind of faith. We got the kind of faith that we just heard somebody say things are supposed to happen magically. Show me a person that did that. You will be not. You will not be showing me the Bible. Show me somebody that got a miracle without suffering and struggling. You will not be showing me the Bible. Everybody who lived by faith had to move forward by faith, not on what they saw, not on what they felt, but they had to put that faith into action. That's why the Bible goes into, into that, that fourth verse when we start looking at it. Um, we go into some Bible characters. This is called the uh, Hall of Faith, right? We look at the lives of these characters. And I love God. Again, you've heard many preachers say, because God shows our weaknesses. He shows the lucky side of us. He shows the stuff that we don't show everybody in church. Come on. We're the folk that know. He shows my shortcomings. Some of those things I wrestle with when I'm home alone and, you know, I'm confronted with just me and all of my doubts and my, my, my intricacies of of obsessiveness just starts hitting me and I gotta fight off the enemy here and fight off that. Then when I get dressed to come to church, I put on my little Christian smile and I look like everything's okay. No, man. I know, madam, I've been in a battle. Have I got somebody know what I'm talking about? Who's fighting out there to know to me? I've been in a battle. And here's the thing. I just wasn't in a battle one day. I was in a battle every day. So what God does, he shows us the weaknesses of these Bible characters who decided to live by faith and they triumphed in spite of what was going on. And what I love is I'm going to read uh, verse 4, which gives us the first character that tries to help us put, now I'll start at verse 4, yeah, it's two biblical characters, but the life of Cain is really just there to show us what not to do when it comes to living by faith, but the life of Abel is there to show us the blessings of God. Let's read verse 4 together. Look at it with me. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Here it is. By which he obtained a witness that he was righteous in right standing with God. God testifying of his gifts and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh by faith. Cain was the firstborn son of Adam and Eve. Right after we get out of chapter 3, where um, Adam and Eve fell, and they got put out of the garden, and there was an angel with a flaming sword, sword placed over the garden so nobody could find it again. And so now we go right into... Chapter 4, where now they're living out their curses. You know, Adam and Eve, everybody got cursed, and now Adam and Eve are living outside of the garden. And now we're into the, the blessing of what God's going to do for us on this long journey <laughs> called redemption, right? So watch this. Uh, Cain was the firstborn son, but bad, a man. He had a bad heart, bad attitude. Just because you're in church, just because you're born into a Christian family, just because you're born of Christian blood, you know, your genetics is you got a mom and dad who love the Lord. There's a greater chance if you're obedient to get those blessings handed down, but there's also a chance of that not happening based on how you live. Abel was their second son. The Hebrew word for Abel is the word Hebel, Hebel, and it means uh, transitory or vanishing or vapor. I believe in biblical times, God, I believe, you know, we know theologically that Bible names were given to bring significance to what the character went through, uh, what the Bible character went through, or who the Bible character was, or the characteristics. Some way that name fits the experience that God wants us to see. And I believe, and most theologians do, that the name Abel, by being a name of, you know, weakness or vapor or transfer, it means that it represents the short time Abel was here, but the power in that shortness. Hmm. Can I tell somebody, I do funerals for folk who are 8 years old to 80 years old. And you know what I found out when people are crying? I've never seen anybody, sometimes people are, you know, they'll scream and holler at a baby's funeral. You know, that's true. But I've seen them scream and holler at grandma's funeral. 
What I'm saying is just because you've been here a while don't mean that the pain is lessened. Time is so precious, but God knows how to get done in us what he wants done in us. Here it is. If we don't waste the time, you should be looking at me now. Don't waste time feeling like you're hopeless or helpless. Don't waste time buying into the devil's lies. Don't waste time because something didn't work. Get back up. Try it again. That's what this lesson of faith is about. Don't waste time. Time is too precious. When, when I find out there's something that didn't work and I know God, God's word does work, I know that it wasn't God. I know that it was me. Amen? Anybody hear me? If God's word didn't work, I know that it was me. What do I mean? It means that God wasn't ready to make that happen and I just need to wait a little longer. It means that I didn't, I didn't trust God enough for that to happen and I need to make sure I get back to the drawing board. There was something happening in my life that made the timing of what God wanted to do not happen. Or maybe some words I spoke, a confession I said that contradicted the first confession I made. Now I'm sitting there wondering because God now got to figure out, well, he doesn't really do. You need to figure out which one you believe. You make this great confession in church when you get by yourself or the pain start happening or things get out of your control and you're going through something, all of a sudden your confession changes. You can't do that. You got to decide which one I'm going to live by. You got to have one of those no matter what experiences. You know what no matter what means? It means when I said it, no matter what. Somebody write no matter what. No matter what, I'm going to stick it. Can I tell you something? A whole lot of what going to come is going to test you to see if you're going to live by faith. Somebody living in some what right now. Because no matter what means that as soon as something's triggered, I got to hold on and continue to believe. I'm going to keep going. I want you to see this. No matter what means you got to get to your dreams no matter what. But there's been a lot happening, Pastor, and I'm getting older, and, and, and the struggle is more, and you can put all kinds of excuses there, but your faith is stronger than the excuses because your faith is tied to the unlimited power of Almighty God. So let's go into this and give some characteristics of Abel. Abel was a shepherd while his brother was a tiller of the ground. We found out that um, one of the curses that happened was Adam was cursed to have to work the ground and work hard and sweat, right? Cain followed in the um, job description or in the career of Adam, except his heart still wasn't what it should be. Now watch, here's the most important thing. Abel developed his faith through the teaching and instructions that he got from his parents. How do we know that? Adam and Eve had enough sense, had lived beautifully, elegantly in the garden. They had enough sense to know when they got kicked out of that garden, they still remembered how good it was. And so they knew God was good. They knew they messed up, but they also knew how to repent and start teaching. So they trained, they started teaching. Uh, if we look at the Bible, it'll tell us that Adam and Eve taught them. Uh, we, go to this, uh, we go to the fourth chapter of Genesis. Let's go there. Let's go to the fourth chapter of Genesis for a minute. I wasn't going to do this, but I want us to see it. The fourth chapter of Genesis. I just told you that after chapter three, beginning chapter four, um, Cain was the firstborn, right? Look at verse one. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. We're in Genesis four. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And then she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, verse 3, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Abel and Abel, he also brought of the first thing of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain, unto his offering, he did not. Now, here is what we know reading that text. Somewhere along the line, the boys were taught what was the offering that God had respect for. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we find out that both of them were trained in the word of God, except I go back to Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Some of you are hearing me, but that's all you're doing. 
You have no intention of applying this. Or your mind is so numbed right now that you just uh, are, are sitting there now. Uh, your mind has been seared with so much preaching. You know what seared is? It's just, uh, it's like no feeling is there. I don't heard this, I don't heard this. But the problem is you never lived this because you got to live this by faith. So the two brothers were trained properly, and one of them, who was Cain, decided that he did not want to give the correct offer. Why did he do that? Cain's story is a little briefer than, um, well, not briefer. Cain's story is a story of anger, weakness, and sin. Hmm. That which is not done of faith is sin. I was wondering, people say, how do I sin that it does not done of faith? Because somewhere along the line, you told God, you promised yourself, you made a confession that I'm going to live by faith. You got saved by faith. So when we walk out of faith, we're telling God that, God, you're not able. I know we're not doing this, you know, sometimes in a very aggressive way intentional, you know, angry manner, but we do it even if we're doing it in a passive, aggressive manner. You're saying to God, man, I can't go through this. I, I don't know, God. I don't know this ain't working. I, I know what the preacher said, but I'm tired of this. This ain't happening. And we get to this point where we start sinning. I don't know what went through Cain's mind, but I do know we're going to find out some things about Cain. Um, Cain did not, in some ways, understand how to respond to his circumstances. You know, the difference sometimes between whether you get a blessing or don't get a blessing is how you respond. Um, if you respond in anger and disappointment, it's going to be hard to get that your spirit to get back in a position where you can receive. That's why you need the Lord's joy, and you've got to have some joy uh, and some happiness in trusting God. You know, it's almost like when I was growing up, we had something called Mr. Softy. You know, ice cream truck would go riding through the neighborhood. And we knew the rounds that ice cream truck was making. And I remember trying to get that money out of my mom sometime. I'm looking out the window, hurry, mom, the man gonna leave, the man gonna leave. And my mom gave me the money. By the time I ran out there, the ice cream man was gone. I remember the first time my brother had this experience. We're sitting there, he crying. We missed the ice cream man. I said, boy, get up. He gonna be over that corner pretty soon. And we ran around the corner to the block. When that man came, we were sitting there waiting, had our money out to get our ice cream. My brother's response, watch this, out of ignorance of not knowing what I knew, that if I just keep pressing, if I go around the corner, the ice cream man gonna still be there. Uh, I just got to press on because he still got that ice cream and I still want it. So I'm going through. My brother's response was just sitting there, whining, crying, probably mad at our parents because they gave us the money late. Better thank God our parents gave us the money at all. But when you start responding negatively, watch me, I'm going somewhere, it balloons into other parts of your character. Now, not only are you just disappointed and despondent and discouraged, you're angry and you're jealous and you're envious. That's what happened to Cain. And when God gave him a clear choice in the text to straighten up, he didn't do it. Think about what happened. When, when God came to Cain, let's, let's read. Look what happened. We, we, we left off. Where the Lord came, and Cain was very wrong. Let's go up here, verse 5. But Cain, but unto Cain's offering, he had not respect, meaning God, the Lord. And Cain was very wrong, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door? And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. God said, I'm giving you a way out. Now, God would not have said, if you do well, if you straighten up. That only reinforces my point that Cain knew the right way to do it. Some of us are mad saying, well, if he was a, a farmer and he gave God a farm, I wasn't good enough. Because we have to know that when we know God's way of doing things, we have to do it God's way and not our way. But what he did, he did not. 
If we keep reading, we find out, and Cain talked about it, uh, talked with his brother, verse 8, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. First murder came from not, oh, living by faith. First murder came because you did not respond in faith. Cain did not respond by faith. He responded naturally. Can you see where I'm going? If you continue to respond naturally, you're never going to make supernatural faith work. I know somebody just got it. I saw the bell ring. Write that down. I need to respond in faith to get faith. Oh, that's good. I need to respond in faith to get faith. Some of you are sitting here wondering, you can't be vacillating back and forth all the time. One time I believe it, the next time I don't believe it. Listen, and I'm, I'm telling you from experiences where I had to slap my own self and correct myself because I'm riding down the road in a pity party. I just got done preaching about how God is going to do it. But I'm human too. That's why I love this. Because God shows that we still need to respond. And I can't live off of yesterday's response. I can't live off the fairy tale. I can't live off of what I thought would happen. I got to live off of where I am. Many of us as children thought, when I get big, what do you want to be, young man? I want to be a policeman. I want to be a scientist. I want to be a doctor, whatever it is, from saying it, maybe having a dream in our mind, to accomplishing it is a great big leap. But as a child, you don't know that. You, as a child, you're just thinking, man, I'm going to live my fairy tale. I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be this doctor. Well, sorry, son, there's a whole lot of education goes in there. There's some money for med school. There's ups and downs you have to go through. Did you get accepted? You know what I mean? We don't look at all of that, and all we look at is the dream, and sometimes that dream, if, if we see it burst in front of our eyes, it takes the energy out of us. And you can see Cain sitting there saying, why didn't God accept my offering? And all of a sudden he went out, and it turned to jealousy, and he slew his brother. The bad thing is, after he did this, you know, and... Many of us wonder why. Why don't God just have pity on me? Why don't God, he's a loving God. That's why some people don't like him, right? If God was love, he would just give this to me. No, God is also a God of rules. He's also a God of us following his word. God doesn't even break his word. See, God doesn't break his word because if God wants to go out and do a miracle outside of his word or any word, he can do that. God's not subject to laws like we are. And that's what makes us sometimes cry out in grace. But what God does not do is go around and make sure um, that what he tells us to do is not being accomplished. He's a fair God in the sense of, oh, there we go somewhere, so don't lose me. In the sense of his sovereignty, meaning that our limited minds, our finite being, we don't even know all of the principles and emphasis that we have to put to make sure something is fair, right? You hear people say all the time, you know, uh, when you have, we, we have four children, and to be fair, I have to treat each one of them differently. Somebody said, don't you treat them all the same? No, because they got different attitudes. This one got this, this one got that, this one got this. Uh, one child, I may be able to just give you $2 and say, go upstairs, clean your room. You got $2 in your pocket. I can give it to another child, they'll take $2 and won't do the room. Or I got somebody, another child, that if I say I'll give you $2, they want $4. Come on. So my point is, we don't even know everything that's fair, but God does. And God's fairness is designed to bring us into the realms of his supernatural blessing. Stop me. Because somebody's about to turn me off, don't do it. Watch this. Maybe... If you did things the way God said, you would have had the blessing by now. And when you saw it, God doesn't always do things what we think is fair. He does it within the realm of who he is, and that's who God is. Now watch this. God came along. He already knew the answer. I like God. He knows the answer. He has the question so we can be blessed. He said, um, where is, let me go back. What's that mean when you get excited? Where are you doing your phone? Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, 
Where is Abel, thy brother? And Cain said, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. And he said, what have you done? I love the fact that God always wants us to repent. He gives us a chance to confess and repent. The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now you are cursed. I'll stop. The curse comes from when we look around and notice that we did not live by faith. Let's look at some lessons that we can get from Abel's sinful response. First one I want you to write down is God looks at our heart. Hebrews 11 and 4. If you look at this in and go back to Hebrews and look at that fourth chapter. It says, by an, this is the a message version. Hebrews 4, chapter 11, 4. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteousness. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. We may fool other people. We can never fool God. He sees and knows all things. Though both Abel and Cain came before the presence of God and brought something to offer, God can see which of them really have the willing heart to give. We may obey God, but if our heart is not right, it's in vain. Let's look at that. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his statue, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. One more. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Verse 4, keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the spring of life. Excuse me, Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the springs of the joy of life. So God is saying, first of all, you got to make sure you answer by not what you feel around you, but have your heart tied down to me and God can bring the blessing.